Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. One of the things we have to manage as real estate investors is our tax liability. We want to pay as little tax as possible, but we also want every tax advantage we can get. Today, we're going to talk about a relatively unknown technique that'll help you preserve tax and make more money. And we've got a great guest today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Uh, joining me as usual, it's our co-host and financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert, you can't get rid of me. One of the things that Russ does a great job of is helping us understand context. And Russ, today, uh, we're going to get our mind around a lot because it's not just what you invest in. What you invest in, say a piece of real estate, hopefully with some sort of asset on top that allows for return is awesome. And we certainly talk about that a lot. Lots of different markets, a lot of different asset types, lots of different ways to invest. But there's also the strategy behind how and when you change assets. If I sell a house that was a rental house after five years, well, I'm going to do something with the proceeds. Hopefully I've made some money. And then there's going to be tax considerations and there's going to be asset protection considerations. And if I do it right, I'm going to move forward over the years and accumulate more and more of a real estate portfolio. And I have to start thinking more and more about this kind of stuff. And so today on the show, we're going to talk about a relatively less talked about structure that allows people some really great benefits. And to start with, I think we have to say that uh, neither Russ uh, nor I nor our guest are uh, tax professionals. And so as always in the real estate guys, we're, we don't give advice. We'll give you some ideas and information, but I think it's some pretty cool information today that will give you some ideas about how to move forward. Yeah, I think, you know, really it comes down to when I got into the space, Robert, as you well know, you know, I'd done a little bit of investing, but I decided that I really wanted to master the art of using debt. I looked at real estate as the ultimate vehicle to control debt and debt as the ultimate vehicle to short the dollar. And I looked at the dollar and said that, you know, it's long, long history was not likely to change and it probably would continue to fall. And so I needed to find a way to use debt. So that was where I came in. So I started a mortgage company so I could become an insider in the world of debt. And then I began to study financial strategy, I had a little bit of background in financial services and securities. Uh, and of course, you know, along the way, when you start making money, you get very interested in tax and tax strategies. And when you have a family, and I had a big family and a lot of responsibility, you start thinking about asset protection and, and insurances and things like that. And when you start putting all of that together, you really, as an individual investor, realize that you're managing streams of income, portfolios of debt, and tax liabilities all together trying to figure out how do I get the most yield, if you will, out of my balance sheet? How do I put my balance sheet, my net worth to work harder? And sometimes you got to reposition equity to do that. And of course, there's transaction costs or what we call friction to make that happen. And when you realize gains, like when you're churning a stock portfolio, every time you sell a stock that you bought at a profit, then you're going to end up having to pay not just a transaction cost, which are fairly minimal, but a, but a tax. Well, the same is true in real estate, but the transaction expenses are pretty substantial too. So equity management, whether you're pulling money out through a cash out refinance and moving it around, or whether you're actually selling a property and then repositioning the equity into a, a new market or a new uh, niche, or even just to accumulate a new depreciation schedule. I mean, there's reasons to do it. 
But you, you know, you have to weigh the kind of the benefit versus the expense. And one of the great tools that we have to do that is a 1031 tax deferred exchange. And people talk about that a lot, you know, just as an individual way to avoid tax, but it's kind of a bigger tool than that. And it's been kind of the bane of the syndicators world. Like, you know, how do you do that? In, in, in a group investment versus just in your individual portfolio. And so trying to solve that problem has really been a difficult uh, challenge, but there has been some new innovations, if you will, in terms of the way people are using some of the structures that are available out there to solve that problem. And we're going to talk about that today. You know, the tax advantages to real estate are one of the big drivers. A few weeks back, we had Dave Zook on the program, and we learned that Dave got into real estate because he had a tax problem. He was making a lot of money in his business, and he grew up learning that, well, if you make a lot of money, you have to pay a lot of tax. Then he met Robert Kiyosaki and Tom Wheelwright and us and learned that that's not true. Real estate can be a great way to pay less legally in tax. And the 1031 exchange is arguably maybe the second best tax tool that there is. And, and we're going to spend a little time on it today, but the essence is if I sell a piece of property uh, that's appreciated and I put all of that gain forward following the many rules, then I can defer the tax. I'm not avoiding the tax. I'm just not paying it right now. And people think, well, that's good. You're not paying tax. Well, it's not even that. The big win for something like the 1031 is that all of the money goes forward to then be invested and leveraged into real estate as opposed to the tax man taking a bite. Yeah, that hurts, but it means you have less money going forward. And so as investors, we've used this tool many times. A lot of our listeners have used this tool many times. We've had 1031 tax deferred exchange intermediaries on our show talking about the tool. But what's really changed is a new approach that makes it a much better tool than it was. When we come back, we're going to talk to Paul Moore from Wellings Capital, who was on the show a few months ago. He's a syndicator and he especially specializes in some great asset classes, but he's also helped unlock the key to a new chapter in 1031 investing. We'll talk to Paul next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real Estate Investment Advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Hey everybody, it's Robert Helms. Thanks for listening to the show. I want to invite you to AIM NatCon 2020. It's the Apartment Investor Mastery National Conference. It's been my pleasure to be the master of ceremonies for this event the last two years. This year, it's all going virtual, which means there are no geographic restrictions. Wherever you are, you can check out this apartment-oriented event. If you're already investing in apartments and you want to sharpen your saw, or if you're thinking about apartments as a potential place to invest, whether that's actively or passively, you're going to want to attend AIM NatCon. My good friends Brad and Jen Sumrock are putting on this event, and they have pulled out the stops. In terms of their faculty, my goodness, Garrett Sutton is coming, author of Own Your Own Corporation and a great guy to learn asset protection from. CPA Tom Wheelwright will be returning. The Real Estate Guys, Russell Gray and yours truly will present and headlining the show, Grant Cardone and Robert Kiyosaki. Over 16 hours of life-changing content from the safety of your own home. Don't miss the Sumrock AIM Nat Con. All you have to do to get the details and register is send an email to AIM Nat Con, A I M N A T C O N, AIM Nat Con at realestateguysradio.com, and I'll see you there. Don't be like Charlie, who scans the internet for IRA information, often getting bad information from copycats who have no idea what they're doing. You deserve to work with a reputable firm that specializes in one thing, the EQRP. Lucky for you, Congress just made it possible for you to get up to $200,000 out of your current 401k or TSP so you can invest that money in real estate or even your own business. Even if you're still working, it's possible to get access to all this money tax-free. Whether you're a full-time investor, a doctor, or a government employee, even if you have employees, the EQRP is your secret weapon. You'll never see the strategy in Money Magazine, only here with the Real Estate Guys. Every major accounting firm in America is quietly sharing this strategy with their wealthy clients, helping them get their funds freed from 401k jail. Hi, I'm Damian Lupo, and we have your solution. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the strategy will be gone forever. The EQRP company is ready to help you unleash your retirement funds now. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report today. 
Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station and all the time at realestateguysradio.com and your favorite podcast outlets. We're talking today about not letting the tax tail wag the dog, but instead looking at strategies for your portfolio when it comes to taxation. And let's say hello to a friend of ours who is a seasoned investor in lots of different ways. Let's say a hi to Paul Moore. Hey, Paul. Hey, Robert. Hey, Russ. How are you? We're good. It's good to have you back. And, uh, you know, just with us uh, three months ago or so, uh, talking about uh, the latest fund that you guys have been working at. So you've got a background in development and construction and owning property and mobile homes and self-storage. So pretty diverse background. But let's just catch up real quick on uh, on what's happening with your fund. Last we visited, you'd kind of put the big pause on because you'd come through a couple of months of raising capital and then COVID struck. Yeah, you know, we we opened actually the week that the stock market dropped uh, in late February, and we actually raised six and a half million dollars in the next month. And we actually we put a lot of restrictions on ourselves on what we're allowed to invest in, who we'll invest with, and we had come to a place where we had a bottleneck with operators. We had gotten really good at saying no. And uh, we have found since some other operators that we're really excited to invest with. So we're opening the fund again and we're uh, taking new investments at this point. So very excited about that. All right. Well, good stuff. Well, it kind of segues into our topic today, and this is something you've uh, really alerted us to and had your mind around for some time. But one of the challenges in syndication, when people can invest passively with someone like yourself into a fund, a lot of pros when it comes to that, because they're hands off. Once they vet the horse and the jockey and the track, then they're on with their lives and you and your teams are are doing the work. And as you mentioned, you make sure you vet the uh, folks that are doing the work so they do a really, really good job. Job, and that's a big, hard part of the job to do. Uh, and even guys that are seasoned at it, like you've shared with us, it, it takes time. You can kiss a lot of frogs. But it's been challenging for people that have some of these accumulated gains where they might consider selling and doing a 1031 exchange. They really can't 1031 into a syndication as much as they'd like to. You know, for many years, there were the various TIC companies. Those are tenants in common arrangements where you could 1031 out of a property or an interest in a property into another interest in a property. And that's a whole can of worms. But for myriad reasons, those didn't always turn out very well. So maybe from your point of view, take us through what some of the pros and cons of the 1031 are so we can continue to get our minds around it. Yeah. So the 1031 exchange is obviously great. I mean, the 2017 tax law, we were all concerned that maybe they were going to take it away. And they did for almost uh, for everybody except real estate investors. So we're really fortunate that they didn't for us. Right. But I mean, the 1031 exchange gives us, you know, great leverage at purchasing power, the ability to compound, you know, tax deferred and sometimes even tax free because if you, you know, if you swap till you drop, there might never pay a capital gains or a recapture tax on that. So the 1031 exchange does give you know, the reset depreciation schedule, you get to reset and start over that accelerated cost segregation like we heard about from Tom Wheelwright. And so, so many advantages to the 1031 exchange. It's such a great benefit to investors. But like you said, it's really hard if you want to go from an active manager to a passive manager. We've had a lot of people over the last three or four years call us with 1031 exchange money that we couldn't help. And we were frustrated and they were frustrated. Well, exactly. Someone has a property. Maybe they even have a small mobile home park. They see what you guys are doing and say, you know what? I'd love to sell this and instead parlay into diversity, you know, geographically and all of that with the the funds that you're doing. And yet that's not really allowed. It's a, it's a like for like exchange. And again, none of us are tax professionals, but having done several of these, the whole idea is that if I sell an asset that's producing income property and I buy an asset that's producing income property and I follow all the rules and there's some pretty you know strict rules. In fact, if you're one day off on some of these exchange rules, you don't have an exchange and you pay tax, right? But if I follow those rules and I work with you know my 
tax professional, maybe my legal professional and a 1031 intermediary, I can get those benefits that you talked about, but it just limits. I have to make sure that I'm having as much or more leverage. I have to put all the money forward. If I don't, it's taxable. That's called boot, the part that you take and and don't put forward, you're going to pay tax on. So it's a great tool, but it's not a perfect tool. And, and I will say there's no perfect tool, but there are some reasons and some methodologies where the 1031 is is a better tool than it's been in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So there there are a lot of hassles, especially I, I talked to somebody the other day who was out going out of a 1031 exchange and they couldn't travel to see the properties they wanted to see because of COVID. And the strange situation we're in is properties are still booming. I mean, they're still... Uh, The prices, the cap rates are still compressed. People are competing for properties. And so it makes it even harder when you have the time pressure and the, the size pressure and the negotiating pressure from a 1031 exchange. It puts people in a really bad position. And a lot of them are frustrated, throw their hands up and give up and pay the tax. And we hate to see that, you know? It's such a good point. I've seen many times in my career, I've seen, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen it too, where people make a decision because of their 1031 to invest in something they might not have otherwise. I remember we had a listing on a property. It was a pretty good property, but we had an agent come to us and say, hey, my client is coming out of a 1031, needs to identify three properties. Now there's different ways of identification, but there's one rule they cleverly call the three property rule that says I can identify identify three potential properties as long as I close on one of them. So he asked if it would be okay if we identified our property, again, we're the listing agent, as one of these three properties. Well, sure. Well, lo and behold, we weren't his first choice, but his first choice fell through. He came back and had two days in which to make this uh, contract on this property. Guess what kind of negotiation position he had when he had no other property that he could name and only one seller he could deal with? It's really bad. I mean, that's the problem, right? right? So it worked out well for my seller because my seller got more than his asking price because of the 1031. Exactly. But the buyer bought his second or third choice property at a bad price. Right. And that happens so much and we hate to see that. And so after seeing this happen a number of times, we started looking into the Delaware Statutory Trust. Now, this is an ownership model that basically is a legal entity that allows people to use this as a replacement property for their 1031 exchange. It allows people to buy fractional interest in this, which eliminates the size concern for the most part, because, you know, if you're selling a $2 million property, you've got to identify generally a 2 million or a little more than that property. And it might be, that makes it even harder with the time pressure, the negotiating issues. But the DST allows people to transfer in to this property. They can actually diversify a couple, among a couple of DSTs and it takes the time pressure, the negotiation hassle, the management hassle, it takes it all away. And so we love this model. And another thing it does is it gives direct ownership, which means that the uh, replacement property is going to flow down the tax deferrals to the individual investor. Yeah, this is fascinating. So the Delaware Statutory Trust is what it sounds like. It's an entity domiciled in Delaware, but the property doesn't have to be in Delaware. The person doesn't have to be in Delaware, right? Right. That's right. You know, it's, it's, it's a Delaware trust and the beneficiaries are actually the people who buy the fractional interest, but the manager who runs it, it basically takes all the management hassle. It puts it in the hands of a professional. It allows the 1031 exchange investor to get a stabilized, predictable return. They don't even have to, like you said, they don't have to be in Delaware and the property doesn't either. Well, I see some other advantages of it. And part of it, Paul, is kind of where people are in their life cycle as an investor. If you start out in your 20s or 30s or 40s and you're acquiring assets, building up a portfolio, when you're in your 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, all that running around maybe doesn't sound like it's so much fun. What do people do? They sell, pay a bunch of tax, or they 1031 into some big behemoth property. In this case, you can just transition slowly over time even into some bigger projects where you've got professional management, folks that are watching the investment carefully, who know their area of expertise geographically and product type and all that. And you still have those benefits, those tax benefits of the 1031. 
31. And I think another thing you kind of brought up was that that size parameter, whether it's 2 million or 200,000 or 20 million, you've got to find a pretty good match. When I 1031, I could 1031 from a single property into multiple properties. I could also 1031 from multiple properties into a single property, but trying to figure all that out in 45 days and close it all within 180 days, which are the timelines required, well, that's just a lot to get done. And for whatever reason also, I don't know why it is, but it seems like everyone in a 1031 goes on vacation during their 45 days. I don't, don't know why. It's just been my experience. So what the Delaware Statutory Trust does is allows people to have the same benefits of the 1031, but rather than find a specific property, they're investing alongside other folks. Yeah, that's right. And we we love that because, I, for example, last year I talked to a guy. He was an attorney in Kentucky and he was really frustrated. He had rolled forward stuff since the 1031 started in the early 90s. And he was going to owe a whopping huge tax on his replacement property. And he said, look, I'm 72. I'm planning to go pay, play tennis in Fort Myers, Florida. I don't want to be managing a $2 million anything, retail strip center, apartment or whatever. And so he found this DST at the last minute. And when he 1031 into that, he was actually able to get a predictable, you know, five, six, seven percent cash flow. And he gets a hundred percent of the appreciation, his share of it, of course, at the end of the line. That's not shared with the operator. So it's really great for him. Last time I talked to him, he was actually playing tennis. He was out on the court and he was telling me he was so happy he had done that. So let's talk about this because like anything, there are pros and there's cons. And we're going to be, you know, full disclosure, what some of the negatives are, because there's a few about this. And you know a lot more about this than, than I do. I've not participated in one of these. So if you have to stop at some point and say, well, that's beyond my pay grade, totally understandable. But I know you have your head around it. One of my big questions is, you know, you have the rules for 1030. How many of those rules follow over and how do those get articulated? For instance, the debt rule. I've got to have as much or more debt. Is that true for this type of an investment structure as well? Yeah, that is one big downside to the 1031 and that does carry over to the DST. So in other words, if you're investing, let's just say it's $100,000 and you have 40% debt, 60% equity, you have to have at least 40,000 in debt in the new uh, investment and 60,000 in equity in the new investment. If you don't, you just pay tax on the part that's out of whack with that. And so if you're going into a DST that just, let's say, has 60% debt and 40% equity, you're slightly off on your ratios and you ha you'll have a little bit of boot to pay taxes on. Okay, but you do get to count your proportionate share of the debt that the operator who's putting together the statutory trust in Delaware has. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You do get to count that. And that's one of the great things about this is you don't have to get your own debt. Think about it. If that $2 million guy was going out to buy a strip center, let's say it was $4 million, he'd have to get $2 million in debt. With this, you get the benefit or the leverage from the debt, but you don't have to take any debt in your name at all, which means you'll have that capacity available to go do something else. Now, Paul, what about those folks who bought a property eons ago and they've paid off their debt, so now it's free and clear and they want a 1031 into, the, how, how would that affect them in this case? So two things, number one, they might go into a DST that they choose because they like the operator, they like the project, et cetera, and they might pay a little bit of boot, number one, or number two, they can go find a DST that is all equity. There's no debt and they do exist and uh, they're not that hard to find. All right, good stuff. So it's a bit to get your mind around this, but think of it as a perfect tool for someone who wants to 1031 rather than a specific property into a trust that owns the property. So it really is the, the return and, and the income model and even the tax breaks are going to be based on the property itself. What are the range of types of properties that make sense for these operators to consider? So the most popular for DSTs for a long time have been things like triple net leases. They might be a Walgreens store or a McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, where the store is leased and basically there's a long-term lease and then you just get predictable income. 
But now DST providers have gone into multifamily. Uh, there are self-storage DSTs, and there are even mobile home park DSTs, which we really like those types. Certainly. Now, part of uh, my research for this show uh, has led me down the path of a lot of the folks that are doing this are actually uh, broker-dealers, and that's not a bad or a good thing. That's you know a licensed structure, but the costs can be high. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so when the guy I told you about, the, uh, Lex, the Kentucky attorney, uh, told me about the DST, he was really, like, really bothered by the steep fees. They're typically 5 to 9 or even 10% on the front end. And that's just the broker-dealer commissions. On top of that, you've got, you know, the setup fees and all the other costs that come with any syndication. And so that really bothered him, and it bothered me. In fact, it made me not want to even do a DST for a long time. But then we talked to some attorneys and we found out it is possible to go direct. In other words, it's possible to set up a Delaware statutory trust where investors can invest directly in it without a broker dealer, saving that upfront commission. So that is an option. Well, that's a good point because I think that as people are trying to figure out this whole management of their portfolio, they want to think about where they're going. I'm not saying you wouldn't pay fees if it made sense on balance. Like, okay, well, I'm going to make a great return. I don't mind paying some fees. And we don't mind paying fees to professionals, right? Vendors that do a great job, syndicators that do a great job, fund managers, they deserve to be paid. It's just, is it in alignment with what's fair? Now, let's contrast this if we can, Paul. I know you've been around real estate long enough to know when we had the the big rush on these tenant in common investments, which uh, the idea that it was similar, you could 1031 from an individual property into a tenant in common. How does that contrast with the DSTs? Yeah, so a tenant in common arrangement uh, means that there's unanimous consent, which means every owner gets an equal vote. And if one owner. And these are people you generally don't know. I mean, right. You might go in with 10 or 20 people and you might know one or two or maybe none of them. Well, if one of them votes to, you know, not sell the property and the other 19 want to sell it, you can't sell it. And so we would call that the rogue investor risk. That's completely eliminated with the Delaware statutory trust. All of the management is put in the hands of the managers, which is a downside for some because some people like control. And so it's not for everybody. Well, that's a good point. You know, there's this gradient, the the continuum, if you will, between active investors, people that roll up their sleeves and do all the work and passive investors who are like, here, take my money. And somewhere in the middle are folks that you and I deal with that they are interested in passively investing, but they're going to spend time vetting the market, vetting the operator, making sure they understand the tax and, and legal aspects of the thing. In this case, Are these operators any different than the typical operators of property and they're just using this facility or is this a whole new uh, breed of syndicators, if you will? No, actually, we like the model where a syndicator who's asset manager, they're managing the property manager, perhaps in-house or not, uh, they're actually selling the property that they already own to a DST that they're part of. That means you keep the same marketing, same management company, stabilized financials, everything's already in place and there's no interruption of service, which allows stability, which is one of the big advantages of the DST, Robert, is the stability and the predictability of the passive income. Well, and that's also probably going to dictate the types of deals that get done. You know, you think of institutional investing, A-class apartment buildings, those kinds of things, which institutions invest in not because there's a lot of huge upside, because of that stability, the veracity of the rent, if you will. Right. That's absolutely true. And that's really important. The DST, the way it's structured, and this is getting into the legal weeds here, but the way it's structured, you have to have stable, predictable, passive income. And if it's not generating something that's predictable and stable, it will throw off the DST. And sometimes DSTs have to actually be abandoned because of that. It has to be a set payment 
And that's why investors can expect a, a set return. Now, with TICs, one of the potential downsides, uh, you mentioned the one about the rogue investor, and that's probably the most important one. Uh, one person could throw the whole deal off. But the ability to sell just your portion, I know a lot of these TIC companies said, no, no, you can 1031 just out of your portion into something else. In reality, that's hard to do. It's hard to sell one fifteenth of a property. Is there any difference between that and the DST? So I would say another disadvantage of the DST, but I mean the same with all syndications, is that it's not liquid. If you think you want to get into the D, a 10-year DST and maybe you want to sell your portion in three years, there's not a liquid, there's not a viable market for that. There is a market for it, but as a syndicator, as someone managing a DST, we're going to tell people, look, don't do this unless you want to stay in for the long haul. Because just like with the tenant in common arrangement, you're probably not going to be able to sell your shares when you want to. Our guest today is Paul Moore. We're talking about the Delaware Statutory Trust as a possible tool to add to your real estate quiver. We're going to play Real Estate Trivia. When we come back, then we'll continue our discussion with Paul. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. The Memphis market is logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid-South Home Buyers, send an email to midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. For thousands of years of human history, silver has been recognized as money. Then in 1965, the United States took silver out of the financial system. But did silver stop being money? Smart investors don't think so. And ever since, when there are concerns about the quality of the currency, alert investors seek shelter in silver and gold. As the size and frequency of major financial crises grow, silver is attracting a lot of attention. To help better understand the what, why, and how of silver, watch the free nine-part series, Making Sense of Silver, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Silver But Didn't Know to Ask, featuring 30-year precious metals veteran Dana Samuelson. Send your email request to silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Whether you own silver now or you're wondering if it's too late, email silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Bill Bonner. I'm author of Warmageddon, and I'm the publisher at Agora, where we publish more than 2.5 million readers around the world with The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into this show. If you've ever wanted to do bigger deals using other people's money, well, it's time to head on out to the secrets of successful syndication, which takes place wherever you are. Yeah, it's our second virtual syndication event. It's coming right up. You can get all the details on the website at realestateguysradio.com under events. We're talking with Paul Moore today about the Delaware Statutory Trust as kind of a unique alternative to the 1031 tax deferred exchange. We'll get back to that discussion after we play Real Estate Trivia, your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question. In a minute, I'm going to ask you a trivia question that kind of has something to do with Delaware. And when you think you know the answer, you're going to send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address. If you're the winner, we're going to send you a really cool book called Desire, Discipline, and Determination. It's a collection of awe-inspiring stories from a bunch of really great folks put together by our friend Kyle Wilson, who will be on the show next week because he's got a brand new book coming out. That can be yours if you didn't know today's real estate trivia question. Last week on the show, we were talking about the cheap and cheerful Central Florida market. We asked this, what's the official nickname of the state of Florida? Lots of you knew, it's the Sunshine State. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Delaware has only three counties, making it the lowest number of counties in any of the United States. 
Which U.S. state has the most counties? So not really about Delaware. Delaware has the least number of counties. Which state has the most number of counties? If you know or want to guess, or maybe you live there, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address so that if you're the winner, we can send you desire, discipline, and determination. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking about a pretty unique tax tool and investment opportunity for folks. And our guest today is Paul Moore from Wellings Capital. We've had Paul on the show talking about his funds. He does mobile home parks and self-storage. And Paul, I imagine, is a guy that syndicates and you get that frustration. You got a guy that goes, hey, I got 800 grand. You go, well, okay, great. We'd love to talk to you about, you know, maybe putting that into one of our funds. Yeah, it's coming out of a property. So because of that, they really can't 1031 into your fund. But through this tool, this Delaware Statutory Trust, that becomes an option. So let's talk about the kinds of people that you see making this transition and looking for these deals. I'd say, first of all, it's somebody who is close to the end of their rope on their 45 days. We had a lady call us and she said, hey, I sold an apartment building in San Diego I've got $630,000 I want to invest. I'm trying to get hold of these realtors. It was in uh, Arkansas. She was trying to uh, get an apartment building or a couple duplexes. And she just, she didn't have time to fly down there. It was almost her 45 days. She was looking for alternatives. That's one type of person. Well, let's stop there for a minute because this makes a ton of sense. If you think about how hard it is to actually live out a 1031 in these cases, you're looking at multiple properties. If the market is strong, like many markets are right now, in spite of COVID, we're still seeing you know multiple offers and situations. That can be a lot of brain damage. But in this case, if they have a pipeline of deals, I'm guessing that most of those operators are already going to have the inspections, the reports, all the information, everything about the property. That's got to shorten that whole time frame down. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, you've, you're investing with an operator who already has done all the heavy lifting. And in some cases, they've actually closed on the property already, and now they're just selling off the units. Right. And uh, there are ways you can do a reverse 1031 exchange, but the problem with that has always been you know, having all the capital to do it. But right. in this case, especially when you talk about converting an existing use or an existing ownership into either a DST or part of a DST, that's a pretty fascinating way to kind of aggregate, you know, multiple properties, I guess. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And uh, sometimes, and, we, and that's another type of person that might want to do this. I, I talked to a, a lady in uh, Tennessee who wants to sell a whole bunch of homes, more or less the same time frame, and she wants to do something completely different. So she doesn't want the management hassle. She wants to save on the depreciation recapture and the capital gains, but she doesn't want the management hassle. So that would be a second type of person who would like to do this. A third type would be somebody who wants to go up from that situation. Let's say it's a bunch of residential to a larger commercial or, you know, to more of an institutional grade property. And they feel like the risk and the management hassle and the predictability and all that is better at that higher level. And that's a great thing about a 1031 and a DST. Now let's talk about one of the other disadvantages and that is accreditation. And that's not necessarily a disadvantage to be an accredited investor, but if you're not accredited, you can still complete a 1031. If I own a rental house and want to do a 1031 tax for an exchange, doesn't matter if I'm accredited or not. But in the case of a DST, don't the investors need to be accredited? So Robert, we understand that if you're a 1031 exchange investor, you can technically go into a Delaware statutory trust without being accredited. The problem is I have yet to find a single DST, and I've looked at a whole bunch, that allows non-accredited investors. I heard from a qualified intermediary that there are some but I have yet to find one. So effectively, this is for accredited investors. Got it. And that just makes sense because of the size of those deals. That's typically those promoters are after accredited investors for all the reasons it makes sense. If you're not sure about those reasons, well, there's 
barely time, but just enough time to get you signed up for our Secrets of Successful Syndication event, which is right around the corner, where we talk about syndication and uh, the reason people consider uh, accredited only. But an accredited investor, it just means that there's fewer of those investors. And it maybe limits opportunity uh, to someone at 1031. Uh, we'll be interesting to see if that vacuum somehow uh, gets filled with folks who recognize the need for that. But in our time remaining, um, talk about what you think some of the highlights are for the DST that maybe we haven't covered yet. Yeah, I want to tell you one more limited, uh, one more downside that I forgot to mention. That is, there's often limited upside with these. Now, here's why: if you're buying a value add property like a mobile home park we invested in two days ago in Michigan, it's got all kinds of obvious things that can significantly increase the asset value. We can bring in more mobile homes. We can actually expand the size of the facility, all kinds of things, all kinds of value adds that are going to allow for a really amazing return. Delaware Statutory Trusts have all that hassle, all the drama, but also most of that upside appreciation wrung out of them. So they're pretty much a, you know, a steady, stable, coupon clipping investment. So if that's what you want, this could be something for you. One good thing about it is it does have uh, all the a hundred percent of the appreciation I think I mentioned earlier goes to the investors, not to the sponsor. So whatever limited appreciation there is um, does go typically, you know, I mean I think it has to go all to the uh, investors. Well, that's a little bit different than with a typical syndication where there's some sort of split. What about the cash flow during the uh, hold period? Uh, is that split between the syndicator and the investors? Actually, it's not. It all goes to the investors. However, there are management fees. So there's property management. Let's say the uh, you know typical property management is you know four to six percent, depending on the asset type. And of course, that goes to the management firm. There are acquisition fees and there's usually a very small liquidation fee at the end. But um, honestly, no, that almost, I mean, almost all the cash flow does go to the investors. Okay. Interesting. Now I'll tell you what we had, uh, Tom, we were on the show a few weeks back and we talked specifically about this uh, in preparation for us having this conversation. Um, how long has this been around? This isn't something that I've been hearing a lot about for a long time. Yeah, they really became popular in the early 2000s. So I believe it was 2000, 2001 or two, somewhere like that, that this sprung into existence. And a lot of them really sprung up uh, before the great financial crisis. A lot of them didn't do well in the financial crisis. Uh, I think they learned that over leveraging and uh, some of the other things that they had done were uh, really negatives. And so, but they've, they've come back really strong since then. Now, Paul, this is a lot for folks to get their minds around. You know, I mean, it's one thing to kind of hear. It's another thing to go through it. You have put together a really great report. Just had a chance to read it. Not only is it great content, but it's laid out beautifully. A lot of charts and graphs. Tell us about the report you put together. Yeah, so I had a hard time getting my brain around this. And so I decided to go out and do research. And so uh, we put Wellings Capital put together this report. It goes over the pros and cons of 1031 exchanges. It you know doesn't pull any punches. We talk about you know the fact that a lot of 1031 exchanges fail for the reasons we talked about, and then we talked about the Delaware Statutory Trust as one potential solution. We define the DST, then we go over about a dozen advantages of the Delaware Statutory Trust, about five disadvantages. And then we give a few brief case studies. One was a failed 1031 exchange and one is a successful uh, Delaware statutory trust. And so that's, uh, that's pretty much the gist of the report. All right, good stuff. Uh, before we're done, we'll tell you how you can get a copy of that report and learn more about the Delaware statutory trust, see if it makes sense. Paul, great to have you on the show. Thanks for bringing this to our attention. Hey, thank you, Robert. Thanks, Russ. It's great to be here again. There's Paul Moore from Wellings Capital. More when we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. 
Hear ye, hear ye. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 19th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year, our sales legend Tom Hopkins, the editor of the Gold Newsletter Brian London, international real estate developer Beth Clifford, and Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner Kyle Wilson. And joining us live and in person for his 9th Investor Summit, Peter Schiff. Plus, returning for his 9th Investor Summit, best-selling author and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate, Ken McElroy. Plus, lots more to be announced. It all begins June 11th in beautiful Belize. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Peter Schiff, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 19th Annual Investor Summit. With everything going on in the world, don't let your lack of financial understanding derail your investments. Real estate investors need to see the bigger economic picture. The Federal Reserve, bonds and interest rates, precious metals, oil and gas, cryptocurrency, and the inner workings of monetary policy. Just a start. If you're at all confused about how and why market metrics intersect and what it means to you as a real estate investor, take your understanding to a new level with the Future of Money and Wealth video collection. Discover the opportunity to hedge against inflation, deflation and stagflation, gain critical insights on real estate niches that perform well in challenging times, and learn specific strategies to fortify your balance sheet before it's too late. Simply send an email to future at realestateguysradio.com for all the details. The future of money and wealth includes 20 videos of powerful presentations and panel discussions featuring Robert Kiyosaki, Peter Schiff, G. Edward Griffin, Dr. Doug Duncan, Simon Black, CPA Tom Wheelwright, Brian London, Dr. Chris Martinson, and many more. Email future at realestateguysradio.com today. Hi, this is Kevin Harrington, an original shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program, now in our 23rd year of broadcast. Lots going on in the Real Estate Guys world. In fact, there's still time for you to join the secrets of successful syndication if you've thought about passively investing or actually putting together other people's money to do bigger deals. The great news is you can attend this event from anywhere in the world. It'll be our second virtual secrets of successful syndication, but it's right around the corner. Get all the details at the website at realestateguysradio.com. Under events, you'll see the secrets of successful syndication. Well, you know, when we have a tax topic of any kind, my eyes can start to glaze over. But this was fascinating stuff and always good to hear from Paul Moore. Well, I mean, I think it's really important because if you're out there and you're a newbie investor and you're just on the front end of your career, you're hoping to develop a tax problem. I mean, that's your dream. Boy, God, please help me have a tax problem. I want to make so much money that I have a huge tax problem, right? And then if you're a syndicator out there, you have to realize that as you're building your fortune, the problems you're solving aren't yours, right? Kiyosaki taught this to us on one of our investor summits. He had a group of people together and he said, folks, listen, you have to always remember who you're talking to. When, you, when you're out there putting your deals together, you're looking to talk to people that already have a tax problem. You're trying to build your fortune, but they have a tax problem. And so the point of that is, just like Dave Zook a few weeks back, when you understand how to put together an offering that helps an affluent person solve their tax problem, you have something compelling. And there's another thing going on in the world right now. The Fed has pushed interest rates down to next to zero, punishing savers. And so people are forced to get into real assets. And a lot of them go into stocks because that's the way to do it, right? You're going to, I'm going to buy stocks, but they take a lot of risk because there's a lot of air in that. If they want income, they go to bonds, but interest rates are zero and they're taking a lot of risk there. This is the type of thing where someone could get the benefits of a real asset, real estate. They can get the benefits of a stable, predictable yield like a bond without any of the downside, and they can solve a tax problem. And for people that have big portfolios of real estate and you want to retire from the, the responsibility of managing all that, this is the solution. And it's a great solution. And I love it because it's Main Street investing in Main Street. Absolutely. And I think the more that you understand about different ways people approach investing, the better. If you're new to real estate investing and just acquiring your first property, that's just the first part of your journey. The more that you understand about this, the better. Having done lots of 1031s, we were involved in many of those TICs and we had investors that decided Ticks. to- 
Go into the ticks, yep. Sometimes they tick you off because they're hard to do. <laughs> well, there's no there's one no perfect answer. And, you know, one of the things I appreciate about Paul is that he spent as much time talking about the disadvantages as the advantages. That's a pragmatic view. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You really have to look at what you're trying to accomplish. But for many, this is a pretty good uh, tool. If you're interested in getting his report on the Delaware Statutory Trusts, all you have to do is send an email to DST. Delaware Statutory Trust. I imagine you could write the whole thing out, but easier just to do DST at realestateguysradio.com. DST at realestateguysradio.com. You'll get that report. And that really does clarify a lot of what we talked about. He starts the report talking about the 1031 with the pros, some of the negatives, and then kind of transitions into how this particular Delaware Statutory Trust arrangement uh, mitigates through some of the problems and creates opportunities. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely a well done uh, piece. Very graphic, very entertaining, very educational. Uh, it's got a lot of good stuff. But you know, you're talking earlier about Paul's candor. So I want to call him out on some bull right now, oh, yeah? if I can. Yeah. You know, because um, one of the things that he said that I thought was very bullish is that properties are still hot that the cap rates are still compressed that, you know, and, and I'll tell you, that's not everywhere, right? I'm pretty sure he's not talking to people that are brokering real estate in Manhattan, right? There's certain markets that aren't doing well. And we've been talking about this for the longest time coming out of 2008 in whatever the next crisis was going to be, we would say is there's going to be winners and losers. And what we learned in 2008 is exactly that there were markets that absolutely tanked that were not set up properly to withstand what happened. And there were other markets that fared better. There were markets that took forever to recover, and there were markets that recovered well. Right now, we know that the Fed is pumping trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars into the system, and there's no yields to be found anywhere. It isn't a surprise that, well, a lot of money is pouring into a few high-profile tech stocks to float indexes. There's a lot of money seeking shelter in things that are real. We're seeing it in the precious metals prices, but you're also seeing it in the right real estate. And that's, to me, one of the biggest arguments for understanding why you want to get plugged into a network of people that make their living going out in the marketplace and turning over rocks and finding those deals and putting things together for people to be able to put their money into, because most of us don't have the time, especially with COVID-19. How are you going to go out and look for deals on your own, right? If you don't already have those relationships that an infrastructure set up, it is difficult to do. But the people who are already plugged in and understand how to get their money, not through Wall Street, but it, you know, from Main Street into Main Street, the key is having some education, which of course is what we're doing here. But it's also about being connected to people that have those networks that can find those deals. And the fact that he's going, hey, it's still red hot out there tells me he's fishing in the right ponds. Hey, if you're thinking about becoming a bigger investor by aggregating capital or passively investing in bigger deals, well... Be sure and join us for the Secrets of Successful Syndication. It's a two-day virtual event, all kinds of great, great content from an incredible faculty and a bunch of bonus content because we're having to go virtual again. We wish we could be together because I can't wait until I can meet you and have you buy me a beer. But until then, we're going to do the event virtually. You can get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com under events. Big thanks to Paul Moore for not only sharing his time today, but all the time he put together he and his team with this incredible report. If you'd like a copy to learn more about the Delaware Statutory Trust, just send an email to DST, like Delaware Statutory Trust, DST at realestateguysradio.com. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.